I was struck uh, as recently as 1990 by how low your wages were. Oh. I've never been a big earner. Well, in the grand scheme of things, don't get me wrong, to the working man, yeah. I think the most I earned was about uh, basic, it was about two, two grand a week, so 100 grand a year. So, listen, let's not kid anybody, it's a great wage. But in, in, the, in the world of football, obviously, I've, I've never earned the money to, to go and live on a golf course for the rest of my life. No. But that, that's no problem to me. It didn't hold any fears for me, the, uh, the threat of uh, stopping playing because I had I'd done the 9 to 5 thing. And you know. talking of the 9 to 5 thing, you had a day job, I think, in the Building Society, yeah, that's in the right. repossessions department. Oh. Were you a bailiff? Were you, uh, were you around in the days of 15% uh, interest yes, rates, I mortgages? Was. Yeah. I, was. I had a mortgage in those days. Horrible. Horrible times. No, I mean, I started at the bottom, filing clerk, making tea for all the bosses, that type of thing, and worked my way up at 16-year-old and went into arrears department, went into repossessions department. Um, not a nice environment to be in, don't get me wrong, when there was opportunity to help people, yeah, um, could. we could. But there was always, there's always the people that knew how to play the system, you know, especially the legal system in Scotland is very different from down here. And There was always people that knew the little tricks of the trade to avoid um, paying their mortgage and things like that at that time, you know. But, but the genuine people, they, you know, one of those unexpected pregnancy where finances are hit because of a new baby or a job loss. Yeah. 15% mortgages, it was a tough, tough time for everybody, you know, so it, it wasn't a nice side of, of the job, to be honest but with you. But you weren't actually turning up on something? No, I wasn't, no. It was our job that if it got too bad, then, yeah, we had to instruct bailiffs, but I was not there at the time, no. Okay. Then bizarrely, it's an incredibly tender age of 21. <laughs> yeah. You fly off to Australia. Why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why else? I, I just thought I'd... My opportunity in Scotland in football had gone. Uh, it's, it really is such a small bubble, Scottish football. And when you've maybe had a disappointing time at one club, very, very, very difficult to get your foot in the door elsewhere. And I had started in the Scottish First Division, 19-year-old uh, Philippines, and desperate to do well at this level. I might get the chance to play in the Scottish Premier League, every little Scottish boy's dream. Uh, never materialised. And I moved from Meadowbank Thistle, uh, who are now Livingston, and signed for Stenhouse Muir, so it was dropping down the way. Uh, things disappointed there, so was released by Meadowbank after a year and a half, released by Stennis Muir after a year and a half, went back and played non-league or junior football as it's called in Scotland, and um, I just thought my time had gone, so I thought, listen, you're not going to get the opportunity again, I, I've got family in Australia and, and you're a coach in Australia, and I thought, hey, but let's you go give, for You it. give the impression in the book that you wouldn't have enjoyed the football career you have had you not gone to Wales. No, it's, it's, a, it's the best move I made, because... Oh. I went away to Australia and found a passion again for the game. I went over there and played for 10 months and really to start enjoying myself. You can almost be whoever you want to be when you move abroad. Nobody knows your past, nobody knows who you are. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Well, you've done it, you've lived abroad. And, and again, you can go over and you can basically reignite yourself. And, and that's the way it worked for me. I went over and I, I did well. Coach started believing in me and um, scoring a few goals. I played as a striker at that time. But out of the blue, I was approached by an agent to go and play in Hong Kong and listen a lot of people will say it was a brave maybe a stupid decision to go to travel to the other side of the world but I just went for it and because I did that I grew in confidence my my own sort of stature grew within the game and I went and I played in, in Hong Kong and did well there I wouldn't listen it's a quiz question somebody that's never played for Scotland has, has actually played against the national team of England full national team of England it's I would never have got that opportunity. I played against the national team of Yugoslavia and Sweden and South Korea and Colombia, just playing in a Hong Kong League 11 every year in the Chinese New Year. They'd pick a League 11, bring over three international teams and play a four-team tournament. The dentist chair, absolutely. I mean, certainly not a den of iniquity that was uh, certainly portrayed in the, in, the, in the local tabloids back here. Definitely not. I mean, it was this... It was an American style diner type of bar which uh, we came into a nightclub after a certain time at night and I mean, and the lads, it was Gaz's birthday, he had played in, in China but didn't actually play in the Hong Kong game, uh, he had taken a knock, he was rested, but Shearer, Platt, Adams, uh, McManaman, uh, honest, it was, it, was, it was like a little boy's dream for me, being a Scotsman, to play against that one. And uh, all, all the headlines were already made, if England win 9-0 that's fine, that's no problem if they... If they 
as it, as it turned out, if they struggled a little bit, they won 1-0 and they, they got slaughtered, you know. And their next game was the game against Scotland? The, the next game, game, I don't know if that was actually that game, but it was straight into the tournament. Yeah. Right. Straight into the tournament uh, on the back of some very negative headlines. But, you know, that could have been the making of that squad, to be honest with you. Because they, they created a, a siege mentality amongst themselves because of the negative press from the trip to the Far East. And they went out and they must have been disappointed not to win the tournament. Some of the stuff they played were brilliant and disappointingly some of the best stuff they played was against my home country, unfortunately. The highs of playing against them in Hong Kong one week and then three weeks later I'm actually in the crowd at Wembley watching the game. We get the equaliser, then we get a penalty and this penalty is saved and then Gascoigne goes up the park and it's Son's Law, it was written in the stars, he was always going to score after the abuse he took and uh, the celebration was there for all to see. And, he was the one player that could win a game on his own for England at that time and I don't think we've had anybody quite like that with that sort of ability since, to be honest with you. We, I'm saying we. So I've, <laughs> I've been down here too long. You played against Paul Gasco and then you're in the crowd at Wembley for Euro yeah. 96 watching him play. You perhaps then weren't, and like most some of us, mm -hmm. as surprised by the technique of that goal that he scored against Scotland. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, he's the type of player that's always had that in his locker. He's the type of player that two minutes after that could have went out and absolutely uh, lunged into somebody and got himself sent off, you know. Um, he scored a wonderful free kick at Wembley and then gets sent off again in the same game, I think it was, was it? For Spurs uh, against Forrest, exactly. I mean, it's, it's, that's the type of guy that he is, but again, that's what made him the player he was. And that's why it, everybody has a soft spot for Paul Gascoigne with regards to his current situation. It's the, the highest low point in my career, uh, it really is, because it was against Celtic, you always want to play against one of the big two, although you know you're going to struggle to win it. Um, two weeks prior to that, second last or third last game of the league game of the season, we had gone to Celtic Park and beat them. We had beat them 2-1, I had played left wing back on the day, and I knew I'd played well. The whole team played well, but I knew personally I'd played well, and I thought, that's the marker, that's the one, he's, he's got to, surely got to go with that team that's, uh, that's going to start the cup final. Now we played Hearts the following week and, and we lost the game. Um, we went from the high of beating Celtic at Parkhead and I don't know, I think it's a natural reaction, they say it shouldn't be, but for players to get that high, we were safe in the top six in Scottish football. I think there was, a, there was always going to be a, a lull before the storm at the cup final and I think everybody's mind was half on the cup final to be honest with you and we had a disappointing game. Um, but two days, two days before the cup final the manager pulls you in as you do and Listen, I've got respect, he's told me before it, instead of turning up at Hamden Park and naming the team and you're not in it, that would have been a bigger kick in the teeth. Um, but I've never felt so low on that one, I was so dis and to this day I still feel I should have started the game, don't get me wrong. Um, everybody has their own and you always look after yourself in that sort of situation, but so it was such a disappointment. A yeah, they had some guy up there, I don't know what, someday, <laughs> someday Larson, something like that. It was his last game for the club, it was my last oh. game for the club as well. But we were 1-0 up. And I was warming up and he says, get stripped. And I thought, right, go on, tin hats on for the last, yeah. whatever it is, half hour of the game. I'm standing on the sidelines, ball's not through to Larson, scores. And the whole tempo and the whole uh, feeling around the stadium changed like that. And I had to go on from, yes, we're, we're, we're high, our fans are behind us, 1-0 up, to suddenly, oh no, here comes the wave of green and white stripes on top of us for the last half hour at 1-1. And they went on and won the game 3-1 three, three and he scored 2. It was a no-brainer. I mean, you've got a dream of playing in England um, from the age of 17, 18, 19 year old. You think your dream of playing in the Scottish Premier League has gone, so you think, right, what's the, ne what's the next stop? Do I, do I try and get down there? And You know, you look, you look in the Premier League and have that dream, and, you, and you, sometimes you have to admit to yourself that you're never going to be good enough to do it at that level, but you want to play down there. And um, to have been approached by first Peter Eustace and obviously uh, Chris that, that made the signing, it was a no-brainer, come down, 33 year old I was when I was given the opportunity to play a club the size of Sheffield Wednesday. So, the club going through the turmoil that it was at the time, silver lining was for me, personally, to get that opportunity to play down here. Signed a one-year contract and ended up staying for four and gave me the highest point in my career that first season and going via Cardiff, etc. Part of the contract that you signed at that time, when I was at Wednesday, meant that any player signing for the club had to live within a 50 mile radius of the stadium. Which meant that I think there was ten lads stay, but stayed up in the Wadsley Park Village development. Um, there was three or four of us that lived the sort of Ranmoor, Fullwood, 
down towards the door end of town. So, after training, if we would decide to go out for a coffee in town, you would always see one of your teammates. Uh, on the back of a victory on a Saturday, if we went out for a meal or a, uh, or a drink or something to celebrate, you don't necessarily go out together, but invariably you'd always bump in and there'd be a group of eight, nine, ten of us together. And I'm not, I'm not going to use the analogy that Walter Smith and all that like, used with regards to the great Rangers team where a good team that drinks together wins together. That wasn't, it wasn't that kind of environment, but it was one of them that we spent a lot of time socially together, which breeds that attitude on a Saturday where you'd, you'd die for each other. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's you'd be there to cover your teammates' backside all the time. Minutes, then, sounds like we were a team. Policy. You know what? We were a team. We were not a, the best individuals that you could put down on a team sheet that's ever played for Sheffield Wednesday. But as a team, and even the boys that were not in the squad or not on the, uh, on, in the starting 11 on the day, were rooting for the lads. Now that, that's a tough thing for a manager to create that sort of togetherness. Uh, they all believed in each other and that is what got us promoted, not because we were a great team. Um, if we hadn't got that penalty, we wouldn't have won that match. We wouldn't have won that match. I think we would have won the match um, if we had got the penalty, the lad wasn't sent off. I just felt the momentum turned on that. The whole stadium changed with eight minutes to go because of that. And initially when I saw it, I thought it was the softest decision in the world. Since then, when you see it from certain angles, he's got a good handful of his shirt. So I felt sorry for Chris Westwood. I thought, you know, that opportunity at the level that we were playing at at the time, you don't get opportunities to play in that sort of situation at that time. And I felt for the kid because he, he was a good player at that level. Hartlepool were a good team, they're a good group of pros as well. And, um, but at the end of the day, you have to be selfish in that situation. I just think that the whole momentum changed on that goal and there was only going to be one winner after that. Don't get me wrong, I think there was one occasion where I had to put in a last ditch tackle, I think, in extra time to stop the kid going right through and go. But um, I just did, I, I felt we went from there and some of our kids grew into men that day. Whelan's, Brunt's. Young Drew Talbot, obviously. You can't, you can't write a script as good as that for a local lad to score with a last kick of the game in a 70,000 seater stadium for your, your, your team, you know, and it was just it was such a surreal 30 seconds in my life, that goal. And you describe it well in the book, and you describe well at the final whistle your own team, yeah. what you did. Yeah. Tell us what you did. Yeah, I mean. I'd been there, don't get me wrong, maybe it was because i uh, uh, been one of the elder statesmen that I maybe took a different slant on it from all the other players and the young lads that celebrating, champion everywhere, hats and gloves, everything on. I, I, I did, I stood back, I stood back. I knew I was, at my age, was never, realistically never going to get the opportunity to, to savour that sort of point again. So I actually stood back and if you see the pictures of them celebrating with the champion everywhere and a big team photo and hats, scarves, gloves and everything on, I'm not in it, I'm not in it. I'll be standing somewhere, I can't remember where exactly, but I'm standing, just just taking the whole scene in. Because I, I wanted to remember that 10, 15 minutes. Um, and it'll stay etched in my brain forever. I mean, every Wednesday fan that comes up, they've seen cup final wins. They've been third in the English First Division stroke Premier League. They've had international players week in, week out, playing with, it, playing with the team. They've had talents, uh, David Hurst and Chris Waddle in their team. But they still, a lot of them still say that that is up there with one of their best days. And I think it's because with Sheffield Wednesday, there's a heck of a lot more lows than there are highs. And that whole game in that 90 minute stroke extra time period probably sums up the life of a Sheffield Wednesday fan in one match. And the highs and the lows and the way, the emotion that goes through their minds. So it was great. I think the, the, the first season after the playoff final was all about survival. Yeah. Um, the, the second season was hopefully progress and the third season was aiming to maybe try and get playoffs and oh, you know, it's the hardest league in the world. Everybody says it and it is, it's, it's ridiculous, you cannot, don't do a coupon. If you do, don't use any championship games in it because it, you just can't, you just can't bear anything type of thing. So. It's ridiculous. But it ran its course, as I, say, as I say, I think it was four years there and obviously Brian Laws, now the manager, and, and came up to me at Christmas and says, look, I'm going to tell you early to give you the opportunity and I respect him for that. Um,
but we're going to take a different tack from next season, and that's fine, no problem. I was hoping that he might come to me and try and get me involved in the in the coaching side of it. That would have been the ideal scenario, but it wasn't to be. So. Um, and you say in the book that coaching is harder than playing, much tougher. Uh, I think it's. It's longer hours, there's more thinking about it as a player, you turn up, the cones are out, the pitch is set, the bibs are laid out for you, the drinks are there for you, everything like that. Yeah, what you don't see is the fact that the coach has been out two hours before you've even turned up to have your breakfast at the training ground, setting everything out, planning the night before, looking at where you need to work on from the previous game, um, looking at uh, opposition's strengths and weaknesses for the game coming up that you want to exploit and a lot of preparation goes into it. Well, let's put it this way, if you, were, if you worked in an office 9 to 5 and you went in on a Monday morning, were off it a little bit, made a couple of mistakes, you'd get pulled in an office and your boss would say, come on Lee, what's happened to you, what's happened in that, da, 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 da. Now switch that round, if you went into your office, made one mistake and you had 30,000 people calling you all the names under the sun, and I've heard it before, calling your partner all names under the sun, um, that type of thing. I mean, I've, I've heard some really gruesome stuff, not not towards my players, or it, sometimes it, it's been, I think, I think it has become a lot more personal. Yeah. It really has become a lot more personal. And I think it is down to modern media. I mean, you're part of Twitter, I'm part of Twitter, Facebook, so all these phone-ins and um, but decisions are immediate. And, th and people get influenced so quickly. Because sometimes I watch a game of football at Hillsborough, and I'll come out the ground, we've maybe lost the game, but I'll think, you know what, we weren't far away there. We hit the bar twice and goalies pulled off two or three wonder saves. We've, had, we've made one mistake at the back, we've come away from the game, 1-0. And I think, you know what, I'm so disappointed. And in the old days, there's no Twitter, internet, anything. You'd go away, you'd sit in the pub with your mates, you'd chat about it. By the time Monday comes, it's gone. But it's constant. On Monday, there's more Twitter feeds. On Tuesday, there's more Twitter feeds. And because I read more and more of it, I'm suddenly being influenced by everybody else's opinions, by some guys thought we were terrible and this individual was awful. So I'm reading that and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking about that individual's game and I'm thinking, oh, he did make a mistake. Oh, he was awful. And then the negativity, it's the same with any headlines in newspapers, it's a scandal that gets the headlines. It's not the good side of things. So uh, uh, people pick up on people's mistakes more than the good things that they do. And I, and I think that's just because it's immediate and it's constant and it's always going. Um, there's no hiding place now, and, and it's, it's, unless you're in that situation, it's very difficult to describe to the, the man. Now, people will say, we pay their wages, they get well paid for it, I don't know. Uh, but that doesn't protect, what you're saying is that the wages mm -hmm. doesn't uh, protect them from feeling like hurt like yeah. any other. Absolutely, absolutely. It is, it is. Do players listen, listen to phone-in shows? Um, I think players... When they're younger, probably do, because they're wanting to listen to hear if anybody's bigging them up. Yeah. They want to see the positive. They'll go on chat websites because they want to see the, the nice things. Um, they want to see that Lee Bullen got 9 out of 10 today, was a leader on the park. But when they switch on the following week, look at and they see Lee Bullen 5 out of 10, should never play for the club again. Then it suddenly hits them and they think, D -d 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 and, and I did that as a youngster. I read them, I read them, and, I, and the, the deflation it puts you through. I got to the point, uh, I just, I did stop doing it. And that's the way it happens, it's not only younger ones, the older ones, they become, it, it does become water off a duck's back at times and they start to handle it. But they must get to a point, even one of the best players that's played in the Premier League, when he snaps like that and jumps into the crowd and karate kicks somebody, Cantona, I mean, there must be somebody every single Saturday with an English football that has a point that they want to do that, but they know they can't. It's a fantastic club to be involved with at the moment. I've had a, a great time for the four years I played at the game and I'm really enjoying the sort of year and a half, almost two years that I've been here already. I think Sheffield Wednesday is a football club. The academy has um, sort of been on the back burner due to the financial situation of the football club since it, it was relegated from the Premier League, so first English First Division. Um, and any finances that they have had has, rightly so, gone towards the first team. So the academy has had to sort of play second fiddle and sort of just deal with things. And we've been left behind by, uh, for a few years, by our, our noisy neighbours up the road uh, who have been producing young players. But we are slowly getting there. We are 
starting to see a little bit of uh, green shoots sprouting from the academy side of things. And we are getting there. I dipped my toe in the water at Falkirk with first team football as assistant manager to Stephen Presley, who's now at Coventry. Um, and it was fantastic. Don't get me wrong, it helps because we probably won more games than we lost. That's the be all and end all. Listen, you got to. You can have a philosophy on the way you want to play the game, whether you want to do the Barcelona passing stuff or you want to do go down a more direct route. Um, but ultimately, the fans pay to watch their team win first and foremost. Do you want to be a manager? I would. I would love the opportunity further down the road. Yeah, but I'm. I'm enjoying learning my trade, shall I say, at the moment. Yeah, I do. I do. I think the club's too big not to do there. Yes, I think we're, we're still a, a little bit away from it. But the nature of English football is that there's always one club. I mean, don't get me wrong, the haves and the half-nots has grown bigger and bigger. And these clubs that get relegated from the Premier League with now with four years parachute as opposed to it was two. And the finances is massive. But Blackpool did it. Burnley did it. Crystal Palace did it. League below, Yeovil's done it up to the championship. Who'd expect that? You know what I mean? Fleetwood are going through the leagues like a, a, a rocket at the moment. The clubs do it, and we're not a small club. We are a big enough club in comparison to some of the clubs in the Premier League. But it's just a case of sticking with each other, supporting each other, fans, players, chairmen, managers, coaches. And we are getting there. But I'm not going to say it's in the next couple of years. But hey, aim for the stars. If you land on the moon, you're not going to be far away.